last week when we want to do hypothesis testing, there are three cases. I'm not sure whether you remember this, right? If you want to test whether the, thank you. If you want to test whether the population mean has increased, we do one tail test here. Correct? We do one tail test here. You want to test whether the population mean has decreased, we do one tail test here. Which means, for example, if you found out after doing tests, you collect data, after you, you if you found out that your mean was 38.2, here, what did we say? We say that actually there is only a 5% chance that the mean will fall greater than 34.9. So it's a very small probability. And this data falls inside this, this, this rejection region. We say, okay, then this assumption is wrong. Then we reject. Our H talk. So far, so good. So far, so good. Actually, I don't think I really define what is this 5%. I don't think I formally defined it. I only said that this 5% is up to you to decide before you conduct the test. But it cannot be 50%, uh, it must be small enough. Follow what I'm saying? Yes, I have not properly defined. Today, I'm going to define what is this 5% we're talking about. This 5%, I did. However, say that this 5%, you know like that. This 5% is the level of significance. And you decide before you conduct it. Why oh, this is flashing? Eh? Okay, whatever. Okay? You decide before you conduct the test. Okay. I'm going to formally define it. You think about it. If mean is indeed 30, if mean, the, if the population mean is indeed 30, okay, and you, out of 100, out of a lot of tests that you do, collect data, collect data, collect data, collect data, collect data, collect data, collect data. Out of the numerous test statistics that you collect, 5% of them will definitely end up here. Follow so far. 5% will definitely end up here. If mean is 30, 5% of the time you end up here. There's a 5% probability you end up here. So therefore, oh, say 100 tests, on average, 5 will end up in this range. So even though the mean is indeed 30. Which means, if mean is 30, out of 100 tests, 5 will end up here. Which means, you will conclude that the mean is not 30, when in fact the mean is 30. <laughs> One more time. One more time. See ya, see ya, see ya. Remember this is our critical value? Remember? Remember this is a critical value? What I mean is, if you collect data, collect, realize that it's 30, whatever, 38 or something, you realize that you will conclude that the mean is not 30. Because it's a very rare event. So far, so good. Alright? Now, what I'm saying is this, huh? So first time you collect, oh okay, you say, oh okay, your mean 38.2, so you conclude that therefore mean is greater than 30. Correct? Yes? So what's good? Now, I say one more time. If the mean is 30 here, if the mean is 30, EVA, EVA, the mean is indeed 30, there is a chance that your Sample mean will still end up with 38.2, right? In fact, there's a 5% chance that it ends up there, right? But if it ends up there, you will conclude that mean is not 30. You will end up with a wrong conclusion. You follow what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is this, uh, out of 1 million tests, out of 100 tests on average, if mean is 30, 5% five of, 5 of it will end up there in the entire right region. Alright? When you end a highlighted region, you will reject H0. And that conclusion, when mean is 30, 5% of the time you end up there, which means 5% of the time, you end up the wrong conclusion. 
it's the wrong conclusion because, and I remember I say, ah, okay, I'm going to write it out. Maybe it's easier for you. See, ah, well, I'm going to write it out. Right, ah? Don't worry. It's a very difficult. I, not that you're stupid, ah. No, 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 no. If you are confused, never mind. The first time I hear it, I also get confused. Okay. If mean is indeed dirty, indeed equal to dirty, ah? Okay. Out of say 100 tests, on average, five tests will conclude that. You see, out of 100 tests, five tests, oh, S R S. If me is indeed 30, out of 100 tests, you will still end, five of them will end up in the highlighted yellow region, right? When you end up in the highlighted region, what will you conclude? You will conclude it's a rare event, therefore mean is not 30, mean is greater than 30. Follow? We'll actually conclude that mean is, is not 30. In fact, this conclusion is a wrong conclusion. It's a wrong conclusion. Follow what I'm saying? So this 5% level of significance level of significance actually means it's the probability of rejecting H naught when actually H naught is true. Okay, power. Okay, power. One more time. Think about it, out of 100 tests you do, it means it's 30. There is this probability of 5% you end up there. And when you end up there, you will conclude that mean it's not 30. Which means the wrong conclusion. So actually this 5% is a percentage error that you are willing to accept. Follow what I'm saying? Correct? So I'm going to define level of significance now. If you refer to your notes, now, you look at page, uh, let me see, uh, level of significance, ah, okay. Page four, okay, page four. Uh, here, page four, ah, okay. Here, the probability, the level of significance, here, ah, look here, the level of significance is actually the probability of rejecting H0 when H0 is true, which is why I said just now. Ah. Follow what I'm saying? Follow what I'm saying? So, properly define H0, ah, um, it's the level of significance. Is the probability of rejecting it not when in fact it's not is true? It's a percentage error. Then some of us will ask quite cleverly and say, actually, then since it's a percentage error, why do you want it to be five percent? Why can't you make it one percent? Why can't you make it zero point one percent? Follow what I'm saying? Because you don't want to make the wrong conclusion. Sure. Now you think about it, you could have made the level of significance smaller. That means the chance of error to be small. Example, you may have done, you may have wanted your level of significance to be 0.1%. Then this one very big, they say uh, 48, whatever. Can you minimize error, you minimize the chance of making the wrong conclusion when in fact mean is indeed 30. But the problem is this, for a lot of tests, even if the mean is not 30, you will still conclude the mean is 30. The other error, what we call a type 2 error. This is what we call a type 1 error. When you make the wrong conclusion, wrong conclusion that the mean is 30, when in fact the mean is 
not offered. Wait, one more time, one more time. Confused. One more time. This error we are talking about is the you conclude that the mean is not 30 when in fact the mean is 30. For long saying, this is 5%. This is the error that we are interested in. We define level of significance. But you cannot make this too small also. If you make this too small, then what's the point of the test? Most of the time you will end up with this conclusion that H not is true. Right? You, you also don't want that to happen. So you must strike a balance. So typically we say, okay, level of significance, 1%, 5%, 10%, okay, fine, 2.5%, whatever. But it cannot be too small. If it's too small, then you take, take the extreme case, if it's whatever, lah, huh? if it's 0.0001%, then this one is 100. Then why you conduct tests? Most of the time you know you end up here, then your mean is always 30. Why you conduct tests? You follow what I'm saying? You know the conclusion. Follow? So, I want to say, uh, level of significance is the probability of rejecting H0 when H0 is true. When H0 is in fact true. Follow? Very good. Now, similarly for a one-tail test, it's the same idea. Correct? If mean is indeed 30, here, if mean is indeed 30 here, um, there is a 5% chance that you end up here, and out of 100 tests, 5 tests will end up there, when in fact mean is 30, so therefore it's a 5% chance of error. Level of significance. Now then, when you understand that, then it makes sense for us to understand what happens if it's a two-tail test. You think about it. We, we talk about this two-tail test, right? We want, if it's a two-tail test, we want to check whether the population where uh, mean has changed. It's not 30 or equal to 30. So, correct? Yes? Now, you think about it. Okay, I'm going to draw the bell curve below here. Huh? No need to copy. Now, if this is 30, you want to check whether the population mean has, is different from 30. It's not 30. You want to, you want to have a 5% chance of error, correct? Right? Of concluding that the mean, wrongly concluding the mean is not 30, when in fact it is 30, your mean should have two sides. You have, have two rejection region. If you, your sample mean end up here, you say mean is not 30. If you sample mean end up here, you also say the mean is not 30 because you are interested in a two sided test. So, if you want a 5% error, then this 5% has got to be divided by on the two sides. You follow what I'm saying? 5% of the time, you will end up with the wrong conclusion that the mean is not 30. So therefore, symmetrical, to, because of symmetry of the bell curve, here must be 2.5%, 2.5%. That's why we do this. You follow so far? You follow so far? That's important. Huh? I, I, I had some students coming here, hey, why do you want to divide on two sides? Why is it not 5% on each side? No, because this 5% is the percentage error. Okay, okay let's move on. Okay, now we're going to talk about, um, let's continue, okay? Test statistic. This, if you want to refer to your notes, then it is section 2.4. Test statistic. But I don't need you to refer, uh, read now. I just need you to look up again. Now, we talk about this. I'm just going to repeat the whole story one more time, okay? If x bar is a normal distribution, it is staying 9 squared over 9. We talked about it last week. We talked about this. We talked about this 5%. We talked about this mean 30. We talked about this 34.9, which is actually the critical value, right? Value, correct? Right? 
And we say that if mean end up here, here, this is what we call the rejection region. Correct? This is what we call the rejection region. Now, um, in this case, we say the test statistic is X bar because we want to test X bar. Correct? Then you collect data, you say 38.2, uh, you, you end up here, therefore it's rejected. So far, so good. And then we, why, then we compare X bar, small X bar, which is the sample, uh, sample mean against critical value of uh, X bar. Correct? Which is, this is the critical value. Uh. There's another way to look at it. There's another way to look at it. Now, if X bar, sorry, follow a normal distribution with mean and this one, then can we standardize it? If take X bar minus 30 divided by square root 9, this is a standard normal. Correct? This is a standard normal. Then we can say, okay, the standard normal has mean 0. And we still want to have a 5% error. Are we able to calculate this critical value? This critical value. Can, right? Because the standard normal critical value 5%, you just inverse norm 0 0.95. Correct? Inverse norm 0 0.95. This value can be calculated. I just quickly calculate for you. Let's not waste time. 4490. 1.449. Correct? Then you ask me, hey, why you do that? It's so troublesome. Then I'll answer that later. Okay, then just follow me first, okay? Then, in this case, the test statistic we are interested in now is actually Z, which is equal to X bar minus 30 divided by root 9. Then you ask me, what the hell are you doing? Right, what are you doing? Actually, right, rubbish. And you, I collect data, I know 38. I compare against 34.9. Isn't that simple? Then why you do extra things? Okay, let me explain. How do you then decide whether it's, you reject H not or not? How do you decide whether the mean is indeed 30 or not? Correct? If mean is indeed 30, then Z, this is the distribution of Z. Distribution uh, X bar minus 30 divided by root 9, you will get standard normal. How do we then decide? Since this relationship is true, when you collect data, when you collect this 38.2, what do you do with 38.2? You will compare. This time you don't talk about X bar, you talk about Z equals to 38.2 minus 30 divided by root. Now you do the same translation for your sample mean. Then you find out this value, you calculate, you get 2.73. This is the standardized value of your sample mean. You get 2.73, then you realize that this 2.73 end up in the rejection region. You still end up the same conclusion. You follow what I'm saying? You still end up the same conclusion that H0 is not true. Again, then you ask the same, this question again. Why do it? <laughs> right? Why do it? That's, yeah. The main reason for doing this is when you standardize, actually the critical value will always remain the same for the same level of significance. Whereas when you do this, for different mean, you have different critical value. Hold on, saying. Hold on, saying. All right? Um, and last time, people don't have calculator. All right? Yeah, so they only have a table of values for standard normal. You ask your parents who took A levels. Actually, I also took A levels without the GCR. Right? We only had a table of values of standard normal. We didn't have the GC to help us do inverse norm for any mean, any variance. So you you no choice, you die that have to standardize. Okay? You ask them, go back and talk to your parents, dinner, dinner, talk to them. Huh? So if they took A, o, uh, a, o, a level stats, they will have a standard normal table. In fact, it's also in element 15. In case your GC spoil, you can usually use it. But GC spoil also die, I cannot draw graph. Sure fail. Huh? 
Hey, don't, hey, don't suffer in silence in A-level when you, your GC is poor, okay? Raise your hand and then we sure we will have GC for you. Or don't suffer in silence, huh? I think you all know, lah, huh? Okay? Can. Anyway, that's that. So what I mean is, you compare this against the critical value of Z, which is in this case, in this case, 1.6449. Then you still end up with the same conclusion. Eh? Of course, eh? because we are doing the same thing. Eh? We are using the same 38.2, 38.2, we end up with the same thing. Now then you say, again, very troublesome. I have good news for you. The GC can help us do some work. The GC can even help us draw that conclusion. Okay, let's do this. Okay, this time, this now, I'm going to talk about uh, 2.5. Okay, now, now I'm going to go to 2.5, section 2.5. P-value. Okay, P-value. Let's recall. Recall, huh? In our Romino pizza case, we say that we collect data and realize that the sample mean is 38.2. It is, we want to check whether if the mean is indeed 30, as it's increased, it has increased from 30. Then we say, oh, okay. In our calculation calculations, we said, oh, because our critical value is 34.9, my 38.2 is here, correct? Therefore, I reject H0, therefore mean is not 30. It has, it's greater than 30. Actually, another way is this. Are we able to calculate this probability? That means the probability of obtaining a value as extreme as our sample data, sample mean. If this probability is small, then we reject it. One more time. Are we able to calculate this probability? Just now, the, the method was to compare 38.2 with 34.9, which is our critical value, right? If this is inside, then okay, fine, we reject it. Another way to do it is this. Are we able to calculate what is the probability that x bar greater than 38.2? And actually, we have calculated. If we use GC, we can calculate, correct? Because if mean is indeed 30, then this probability we have found is 0. Point, what? 0.0. .0 Three one three five. All right, we can calculate because we have our GC. Uh, okay, uh, there. Are, correct. Then you turn on. Correct. Uh, Thirty eight point two. Thirty-three. Correct. Zero point zero zero three five. Correct. Then we got that. Now, okay. Good news. Good news. No, not this year. Good news is here. Good news. Ah. The GC is able to calculate this for us. Without, what I mean is, without entering the, the, the those things, the GC is able to tell you that 0, 0.003135 0, 0, uh, directly. If you enter 38.2, you don't need to tell the GC what is your, uh, don't need to use normal CDF. Okay, I demonstrate it for you. But before that, I want to define this probability 
this is what we call the p-value. What's so special about the p-value? I explain. First thing, the p-value is the probability that x bar takes a value as extreme or as large as the observed value in the test. Okay, you see, you observe the value 38.2. The p-value in this case is the probability that x bar is greater than 38.2. It's as extreme as that. Actually, the smaller the p-value, right, the smaller the p-value, the rarer the event, right? Correct? Which actually means that the more evidence we have to say that the mean is not 30. Right? If the mean is indeed 30, you wouldn't have ended up there. Follow? If the mean is indeed 30, you wouldn't end up there. So actually, p-value, the smaller the p-value, the more evidence we have against H0. H0 is when the mean is 30. Correct? Make sense? Does it make sense? The smaller the p-value, the smaller this probability is, the smaller this probability is, the more evidence we have against H0. Follow me. All right. I know. Never mind. Later we go to example, we will, you will see a bit clearer. Then this p-value can make us do decision making. You look, okay, I, I want to emphasize, I want, to, I want you to look at this diagram carefully. Look here. You can do decision making by critical value. What I mean is, this is critical value, right? Then you collect data, you get 38.2, you decide, okay, we judge each one. Alternatively, you could have calculated the p-value, this value is 0 0.003135, and you compare this 0 0.003135 against your level of significance. Because you know that this is, this is 5%. Correct? If your p-value is smaller than 5%, you reject. Follow? Oh, it's the same thing. If your p-value is smaller than 5%, you reject. If your p-value is smaller than your level of significance, you reject. So the p-value is very useful now. The p-value helps us do decision making. So, decision making. If p-value is smaller or equals to level of significance, you reject H1. This is level of significance. If p-value is greater than level of significance, you do not reject H1. For, sorry. Right? Because you're only prepared to accept a 5% error. Correct? Am I going to Zoli? Yes. Yes, ah. Okay, let me hurry up. Okay. So now we can calculate p-value. Okay, now I'm going to demonstrate how the GC calculate the p-value for you and do decision making. Okay. 
Now we look here. Uh. The GC has this function called, you go to stat. In this case, we only do Z test for now, uh, for now, uh, Z test, because the test statistic is Z. We do Z test. All right? Okay. Uh, don't worry about data for now. We do stat. Stat means you enter you enter whether your mu not mu not means whether you check whether your mean is 30 or not 30. So with that, type 30. This sigma is the sigma for your population. Population, ah, population. In this case, it's 9. X bar, after you collect data, you get 38.2. Correct? N is the number of data you collect. To calculate this 38.2, you collect nine pieces, right? Remember, we took nine occasions, right? Divide by nine, we get 38.2. So this is nine. Then the GC tell you whether you want to do a one-tail test, two-tail test. In this case, we want to check whether the delivery time is increased from 30. So we do this greater than it. Then we make sense of this. What does this tell us? Interestingly, if you look carefully, you will know the p value. Correct? And what you get is the z value. Remember this 2.73? Remember 2.73? This is the normalized z value. But most of the time, we won't use it. Most of the time, we only look at p value. The GC tells us p value. We compare against level of significance. Then you do decision making. Done. Follow. Okay, now I'm going to talk about. Follow so far. Now I'm going to talk about what if it's a two tail test. We all talk about one tail test, huh? p value for one tail test. The interesting thing about it is this for a two tail test, suppose now we want to do a two-tail test. That means and your level of significance still remain at 5%. Suppose. Now, then you see this is your X 30. And you test that this is 38.2. Correct? Correct? Now, what is our p value? Just now we mentioned, ah, uh, one more time, look here. The p value is the probability of getting a value as extreme as the DA.2, which is the observed value. In that case, it was 0 0.003135. 0, 0, 3, 3, now, But while this value is 0 0.003135, we must be very careful in this case because we are doing a two-tail test. So while you got a 38.2, the probability of getting a value as extreme as this is not 0 0.003135. It's 0 0.003135 multiplied because there are two extremes that we want to test. So therefore, in this case, the p-value is 2 times of 0 0.003135. Just keep this in mind for now. Don't need to fully understand. So I don't, I'm not too concerned if you don't fully understand. I'm not too concerned. But just remember, for two-tail tests, you are talking about here. The sum of these two extreme 30 minus 8.2. This two. Two times. Never mind. Keep this in mind first. Then we put uh, we will revisit later. Okay? Okay, good. Okay, break. Wow. Talk to your friend.